Hey gang, today's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash Naked Diner. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hey everybody, this is Andrew Hall, and this is the Naked Diner Podcast, episode number 25, featuring science comedian Brian Mallow. Jack, I feel like we should have some kind of dramatic music there, but we don't. Ooh, I like that. Even though I was thinking about more bum, 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 but yeah, you know, he's a comedian. He's a funny guy. Yeah. He, this is a great episode because he's a funny guy. He's a smart guy. And he loves to talk the funny. And he talks a lot about the science of comedy. You'll hear that term peppered, peppered through the conversation. Well, you'll hear those two words peppered through the conversation. I don't know if he yes. said science of comedy anywhere in the. He, I'd have to listen to it again. Yeah. I haven't he cut did. it yet. So I don't, I haven't committed the whole thing to my the mind palace. The mind palace there. <laughs> the, you, the mind palace has many rooms. Is that what they say in the good book? The good book of Jack. The truth of it is that when I'm editing, when I'm editing an episode, I have to go through it a couple times. So you know, by the time the episode goes out, pretty much know all of it verbatim. Like you could give like a monologue. You could do a one-man play of the entire what, episode. Maybe we'll do that. Maybe maybe when we start the Patreon account, we'll do that as bonus shows. One-man reenactments of episodes. <laughs> Crying is included. <laughs> <laughs> maybe just YouTube videos of me editing. You know. Lots of oh, how would that three hours back? of me sitting at a computer and swearing, <laughs> swearing. <and laughs> okay, well, you know, maybe the, not. the joke. The joke might seem funny initially, but after you listen to the same bit of, uh, of the recording three or four times over, I imagine the the magic's lost a little bit. There's a there's an entire YouTube channel of a guy listening to things and eating bags of carrots. <sighs> Is it popular? Are you trying to some tell of his videos this? have like ten thousand views? You're trying to tell me that this is what I should be getting into? Is this is the business model? <laughs> I, should just have, I should just have like a YouTube channel where I watch porn and eat like chips or something? Is that it? Today, Andy watches BBW porn, and then I'll just have like a bag of fulls or something. <laughs> this week, right. it's specifically porn that features people with bad spray tans, and Andy <laughs> will be eating Cheetos. <laughs> Uh, I like Cheetos, though. <laughs> yeah, but you don't want to mix Cheetos and masturbating. No, no. Did I ever tell you my uh, masturbating and chili story? No, but that sounds horrifying. All right, so, you know, so I was making chili, and I make a really good chili, too. So I was getting the peppers, and, you know, with the peppers, you have to roast the peppers first to get the skins off, and then you get slip the skins off of them. And then you get the seeds out, and then you go chippy chop, chippy chop, chippy chop. You know, like some kind of weird serial killer kind of fashion. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. And then you throw the goodies into the pot with all the other good stuff. And then, you know, you wash your hands. Now, I was alone in the house. This is a number of years ago. I was alone in the house. No one was around except for me and the chili. And I'm thinking, porn, right? I'm just going to... Like you do. Like I do, right. So I don't know what kind of porn I was watching that day. But I suddenly realized that there was a burning sensation in the nether regions. And I'm going to myself, oh, my God, this is just like the time that I put my fingers in my eyes while I was working with the chilies. And it was a horrible experience, except now, now it's my penis. And I said, well, what the hell am I going to do? And then I remember Good Eats, Alton Brown. And he said, no. hey, if, really? you, if you use milk... <laughs> You well built, dude. It was it was like really <laughs> discomforting. This this burning sensation on my fucking <laughs> and I had a half a gallon in the fucking refrigerator. So yeah, right, right there in the tub, pouring the milk all over the privates. You know, does that only work with like dairy milk? Yeah, I did. I imagine the, the there's a different. Well, I'm guessing. But I don't think soy milk would work because there's a different. There's a distinct chemical substance a molecule in the milk that that neutralizes what is the capsin the capsaicin capsaicin thank you that's in the chili so yeah well the huh. next time in case i ever do the same thing and if there's soy milk around 
I'll try the fucking soy milk first. That that is dedication to scientific inquiry, sir. My my, my girlfriend has um soy milk. She has the coconut milk. I like the coconut milk. I'm a and fan then, of the coconut milk. So, and then I have the milk. So in case I ever do such a horrible act again, I will start off with the soy milk and then move on to the coconut milk and then to finish the experiment. You know, I mean, I'm assuming that those two things will not well, work. Well, that's, that's not exactly scientifically rigorous, though. I mean, you'd have to do it three times and try a different one each time. Listen. Right? I'm, we got a science comedian on. We need to be scientifically rigorous. I'm not going to be cruising for dick and asking guys, hey, I got this these chilies, and um, you're going to have to work your penis a bit. I, that's, not, that's just a little bit too weird for me, man. I guarantee if you put up something on Craigslist, you'd get at least three guys. Oh, at least. And well, you know, the thing is, you know, as my science teacher used to tell me, my experimental psych teacher used to say, beware the N under, under 20. That's it. If you have a number of subjects under 20 in any experiment, you have to be careful. You have to look at it with suspicion. So I'd have to get like 20 guys who are willing to put fucking like ch hot chilies on their fucking penis purposefully, you know? I mean, that this is the sound... internet. <laughs> right. There's probably a subreddit for people like that. You know, right now, this is the most email that we're ever going to get. <laughs> it's like, you know, I really want to try this whole coconut milk, soy milk, dairy milk with the penis thing. I want to check that shit out. <laughs> Yeah, make yeah. a YouTube channel about that. If yeah. anybody, if anybody tries it, let us let us know how it go, how it went. Yeah, definitely. D don't send because, video, but let no, us no, know how it like, went. Yeah, yeah, because you know someone's tried that before, dude. Has, there might already not. be a dominatrix with like statistical data already. Mm -hmm. This is true. All right, so was that the intro? That was one I hell think of an so. intro. <laughs> that was good. Anyway, science comedy. Science comedy. You'll laugh. You'll know stuff about science. You'll know more stuff about comedy. Yeah, Brian's a, Brian's a sharp guy. It's, it's going to be fun. Yep, it is. It, it was a very good conversation. And he's one of those guests that we could have talked for another hour, another probably two hours, to tell you the truth. But he'll be back on again, more than likely. More than likely. Yeah. yeah. All he'll right, be, gang. Gang. I like Hob goblins. <laughs> All you think is hobgoblins. <laughs> Gangs of hobgoblins. I don't really have a... a collective pronoun for listeners yet. No. no. I, I don't like every once in a while. But... I don't know. Orcs. I don't go through my old monster manual try to figure out <laughs> the, best, the best nomenclature, you know. All right, gang, enjoy. Enjoy. Hey. 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 I just shut off my video aspect of Skype, and I say to myself, you know, I really look better that way. <laughs> In the, I think. You know, uh, I you just reminded me of something I once, uh, my wife, but my girlfriend at the time, I remember a long time ago, and I thought this could be a funny bit for anyone to say, it's that, uh, like, like, you're in bed, and then you turn the lights off, and you wait a beat. And then you say, you look beautiful in this light. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and I was like, I, I never, I don't think that maybe years ago I did, but I, I always wanted to like offer that as advice. Like here's and, and as advice as a guaranteed laugh, like here's something I can give you that should be a guaranteed laugh, you know, as long as, uh, unless it's, <laughs> unless it plays as a complete insult, but it should just be yeah. a total, <laughs> you know, well, you just say you look beautiful in this light. Ha ha. And it's like, so it's my little giveaway. You can, you can use that. That's a good, not, that's a good. Not on stage, just in bed. <laughs> right. Well, yes. Yeah. I get more laughs there anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <So> Ryan, <laughs> <laughs> well, I imagine you don't want to say that kind of line right after a fight, you know? After right, right, right. You want to be on good terms with the person that you are uh, in bed with. <laughs> Completely defenseless, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, you're right. That is a delicate situation. But, you know, for a lot of people, I just mean you're in bed with your best uh, friend and mate or whatever. And uh, or maybe it's not even that far, but whatever. Well, you would hope that you're going to be someone in bed that, with someone. Down exactly. Down. Not someone you're spite fucking. Someone that you <laughs> someone that you're in bed having fun with. You understand each other. 
You, you can always tell how good the episode's going to be when you start talking about spite fucking within, <laughs> within five minutes. <laughs> are we on? Is this on the record? Yes and no. I mean, you know, I, I well, it, we, are we just let the tape roll and then we edit a bunch of stuff out depending. So you can just always off the record something and let me know and <laughs> right. it'll, it'll go away. That kind of you thing. could always say, you know, I don't know if the spite fucking really is congruent with my persona as science comedian. <laughs> but the problem is, as as you know, Andrew, because I think we sort of touched on this the other day, is that uh, um, I'm not sure because there's always been this thing about your persona on stage and who you really are. And it's always hard to separate things. I've been told, I've told a joke on stage and a comedian friend of mine said, that was a great set, but that one joke, it just, it's not you. It doesn't fit. It doesn't work for you on stage. And he's, and he's right. But the weird part of it is, well, I wrote it just like all these others. It is a part of me. That thought came in my head. But for some reason, there is something different. Uh, everything that I think of doesn't necessarily work coming out of my face on stage. I think <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. I, 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 could, I could definitely see that. But it is a part of me, undeniably. So, all right, you know, and 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 anyone who is in entertainment knows that there are more marketable aspects of one's personality, right? You know? <laughs> and and the other bits might be marketable uh, to somebody else to, to, to for them to incorporate into their onstage personality. Like well, I've had dirty jokes that I thought, you know, I can't even say that joke. That's not. I know that doesn't work coming from me. But it would totally work coming from Doug Stanhope or Andrew right. Dice Clay or from Dave Attell or, or even Louis C.K. You know, someone who yeah. is always saying shocking, uh, yeah. strong things like that. Yeah. 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 I've given people jokes. It's like, I know this isn't going to work for me. If you want to have it, you can have it. You know, uh, yeah. I'm not I'm not going to have any use for it. So so being a science comedian, do you have a set of dirty jokes specifically designed for like bioengineers <laughs> no uh no uh no, i can't give you anything quite that specific but i have had jokes that are a little that they're kind of sciency but they're also um they have some they, they might be a little dirty or they might have something that isn't uh i don't know that some people in my audience could balk at i guess sure Sure. Uh, so there's, but you know what? I've always thought of, I've always liked the idea of themed shows or themed albums or CDs, not to use such an archaic term, either of those <laughs> archaic terms. <laughs> a, a collection of digital downloads, I mean. Yes, yes. Downloads? What's a download? I mean, digital <laughs> streaming content. <laughs> Download? Who needs to do that anymore? That's like, that's three stages of archaic, you know, album. <laughs> And right. For that, I think what was the, you know, eight track or, or Edison wax cylinders. Oh, wax cylinders. That's yes. right. <laughs> the, first, the first comedians released some great uh, wax cylinders. I had that. Wax. That was one of my favorite wax cylinders. The good thing um, is I don't have to worry about audio quality whatsoever. People are just <laughs> happy to be there. Exactly. So uh, anyway, yeah, from it's amazing how in such a short time we went from albums to to CDs and then the disappearance of CDs. And then even really almost the disappearance of downloads. It may be in Pandora. You can't choose exactly what you want to hear. But with your premium Spotify account, you can hear right, almost right. anything. <laughs> even the Beatles were added a few months ago. So uh, that's a and dream it's... we always used to have. And especially in a car. This is something <laughs> that I believe I fantasized about it a long time ago. You can be driving down a highway in a moving vehicle. Think of a song and hear it right then and access the lyrics as well. Those are fantasies of, from my young life uh, before we had personal computers even. So oh, yeah. it's a pain, kind of amazing. True we enough. take some stuff for granted there. It's like that was a fantasy. Or, or those uh, Soundhound and Shazam where you just you, you <laughs> touch a button and it tells, and, you know, it's like, what is this song playing? And now you, that was another fantasy forever. Whoever thought of of that that was answering a uh, a dream <laughs> you know what i'm looking for is that something akin to that except like what can i do what should i be doing with my life you know if there's like, <laughs> is, is there an app is there an app <laughs> i get just talking to an app it's like you know i what should i be doing right now like can right I, now right now <laughs> can i just point my phone's camera at a happy person and it'll tell me what to do to 
feel like that. Right. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, oh, yeah, exactly. Can I sample that? <laughs> hey, it's, it's almost like that when Harry met Sally, I'll have what she's having line. Oh, wow. um, it's like you see someone having such a good life, and if you could just sample it and then model it, like apply those settings to your life. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> that, that exists in Final Cut Pro to, like, <laughs> that, that like uh if there's say you're interviewing me and you know the audio the audio quality is different you can copy the settings you can say i want this this track to have the same feel as the other track and it's effective and it works mm. so yeah i like that idea applying that you know what that to me i uh, uh at the start of my comedy career and personal computers had not been in our lives very long. And I really was captivated with the idea of the undo function. What, how amazing mm. that would be in real life. If you could just undo the last thing you did, you, can't, mm-hmm. if, you know, you can't make the mistake of doing another thing that you can't. I mean, some, some software has multiple levels of undo, but some you can only undo the last thing you did. Because once you undo that, then you get a redo, which is really undo for undo. Right. <laughs> you, know right. I mean? <laughs> you know, I undid it. No, I've got to undo that undo. And and that's redo. I, 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 yeah. I, I think if I think if people were given the option, there'd be there'd be a significant minority of the population, percentage wise, that would go, you know, maybe the last thirty years didn't really work out for me too well. I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see how far I can go back and and when things went wrong, you know, if you could identify, <laughs> see, that would be a great aspect of the app too, is that yeah. when did things go wrong for me? And let's just go back to that point. Oh, the singularity is going to make that weird. People are going to have restore points. So <laughs> yeah, like, exactly, you'll be able exactly. to be like, my last month was horrible. I'm just going to start over. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting kind of Groundhog Day thing. But where you have those, like, like if you use Time Machine on the Mac and you have all these, yeah, set points, um, you could go you back to any day. Philip- that, yeah. Go ahead. Philip K. Dick story. Good, yeah. Uh, uh, what would be a good Philip K. Dick story is that if you could just do something like that for the whole society. Yeah. You know, it's like this is, you know, like, you know, if there was a particular uh, point in history that things weren't working out that good, maybe we could just go back to that and just do a redo. I think that that would be that would be a good story. But how do you uh, ensure that we don't go down the, that we don't just repeat the same thing? Robots. Robots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now. Well, you program your phone to remind you not to do certain things after. Right. <laughs> that would be a nice ability. So, Brian, do you come from a, a smart and funny family? Hmm. Well, uh, we're Jewish, so I guess, is that a good enough answer? <laughs> um, we, uh, there really is something about uh, and maybe about Jews valuing both those things, and uh, intelligence, education, and um, humor. But, um, yeah. I, well, you, you know, my parents, so, so my dad was an accountant, and my mom... Uh, really, she did a little work for him, but was mostly a mother and housewife. And uh, they they did read some, but I wouldn't say interesting stuff. They weren't into science. I'm not sure where I got that. I got into science and science fiction at a very early age. Those were my subjects. I also was into writing and creativity. Uh, so I kind of had this thing where I was a little divided because I, I strongly liked the math and science and was good at it. But I was also pretty early on doing some creative writing. And uh, so there was the English and writing and art side as well. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. They they uh, they were good supporters of I have one sibling, a younger sister by two years. And uh, and she became a lawyer and I oh, really? became. Me, yes, and I became a comedian, and in a way, I could see in some ways, I think what we did the same. We have some kind of attention to detail and, you know, building a def- either whether it's building a defense or an offense, picking apart the other side's offense or defense um, and having a good defense. And then, uh, I don't know, I see some correlations there. Early on, I noticed that. It's like, huh, so you do that in that context and for big money. And <laughs> and I was always this struggling comedian, but feeling like kind of the same. It's like I att- I build arguments and attack things and construct things and poke holes in other people's things. <laughs> I, is that a pretty good definition of a comedian? That, well, that, isn't that what a that's my impression of what comedians <laughs> are anyway? We're building and destroying things. I, I definitely see that. You know, yeah, but it's, it's, it's like very often, you know, there is this 
here's something about the science of comedy. Mm. You know, very often people say, especially in response to kind of a cheap and offensive, bad kind of humor, like the kind of stuff that would happen in the wake of 9-11, and you would get some racist and cheap stereotype-based kind of humor. And people say, you know, humor is a defense mechanism. It's a defense mechanism. They say that as a negative thing, that right. instead of embracing reality, you're sort of stiff arming it, holding it at a distance with these cheap, bad jokes. It's a defense mechanism and that's negative. But you know, it, when we look at our best comedians, you look at George Carlin and Bill Hicks and Louis C.K. and Mark Maron and, and, and I mean, and not all our best comedians, but say that kind of social commentator. And even when it's just on a uh, personal level, you know, they, they might have some kind of silly disarming jokes like that, but a lot of their stuff, it's the opposite. It's yeah. offensive. It attacks things. It attacks things that need to be attacked. It attacks things that you that are under our radar or assumed or taken for granted and revealing this. So it's digging deep. Like, you know, Bill Hicks would go to the heart of an issue. All these, mm -hmm. all, all of them do. And even if somebody else, like, I, I, I wouldn't put Brian Regan in that same style, ex except that I just, he's one of my favorite comedians. I think he's brilliant, but it's a different kind. You know, he doesn't attack big social and political issues. It's very much personal experience kind of stuff. You know, they reveal things that most of us don't notice. They peel back layers and and they poke holes in things that are accepted. Like this is accepted. And George Carlin will go, no, that here's why not. And you go, oh, you're right. I didn't mm -hmm. even think of it that deeply. Sure, sure. Yeah. No. Hey, gang, it's Jack. Thanks for listening to the show. Hope you're enjoying it. This seemed like an opportune time to cut in and tell you about a new way that Andy and I have come up with to try and hopefully make the show make some money. But unlike most of our schemes, this one isn't actually going to cost you any extra money. So it's great all around. What we've done is if you like the show, you like our guests, and maybe you want to find out more about those guests. Well, if you go to zxh-creative.com slash shop, We've set up a little Amazon storefront with links to all kinds of stuff from all of the guests we've had on the show. Well, not all, but the ones who have stuff on Amazon anyway. Books, stand-up specials, CDs, an entire curated list of stuff for sale from people who have been on the show. And, you know, links to other stuff on Amazon that we think you might like. You can also use any of the Amazon search links on zxh-creative.com to do your Amazon shopping, and that would help us out too. And it doesn't cost you anything more than if you went to Amazon and did it. You're just going through our site first. So if you like the show, if you want to help out, this is a way you can do it without it costing you any more than you were already going to spend at Amazon anyway. And the shop link is a great place to find all the stuff from people who have been on the show all in one place. So do that. Check it out. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay, back to the show. Now, it's interesting because a lot of comics do deconstruct yeah. you know, societal ills. But, but as a science comedian, you're not really venting your spleen as much as saying, look at this cool stuff and I'm going to write a joke about it. Yeah. I've written some sort of social and political stuff along the way. And I think it still <clears throat> has the same flavor uh, as some of my other stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but eventually, you know, I didn't always call myself a science comedian. I was just a comedian. Right. And um, I, but I liked science first. So my love of science and science fiction is older, not comedy. Uh, that came much later. So by the time I got into comedy, I already had this sort of science flavor. Yeah. And But it took me a long time to realize, hey, I should call it science comedy. And hey, look, the domain sciencecomedian.com is available. That's weird. Either that's a, <laughs> that's either a good sign or a really bad sign. Um, <laughs> useless discarded real estate on the web. But um, it turned out to be great for me. Because it does. It's like, oh, wow, that's kind of what I was doing. So it was like a recognition. It wasn't a calculated plan. It was a recognition that I was already doing that. And it's like, yeah. oh, this is what I am. I should strip the other stuff away and focus on this. I haven't really figured out how to describe exactly what it is because I celebrate science. I like to talk about it and be passionate about it. But if I talk about it, inevitably, you know, hopefully I say something funny too, but it's not at the expense of it. I don't know. It's, right. but it's finding humor in there. It's finding uh, a lot of it is playing with science terminology, language, and weird, you know, absurdly using like this old bit where I would notice that my mom would lose weight, my dad would gain weight. 
-hmm. and my dad would lose weight. My mom would gain weight. It was like the conservation of mass within our family. (laughs) Yeah, so I had a theory that you never actually lose weight. You just give it to somebody else. Uh, That could be neither created nor destroyed. It's one of the basic laws of the universe. So that's that's just silliness, though. That's just absurdly. Of course, that's not the conservation of mass. But how silly (laughs) to take this thing and apply it there so it's just like it's a kind of some of it is a kind of absurd humor and you know arguably maybe you could learn some but i don't feel like i'm teaching i'm just being silly for people that have the same as this is the right way to say zeitgeist or the same vocabulary as me as long as you understand what these terms mean then you'll find it really funny and if you don't maybe you'll kind of glean something from it now, I would imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, that you must have a set of jokes specifically designed for engineers, scientists, PhD peoples, and then you have jokes that, you know, an intelligent layperson would, would be able to understand. Like, I'm not a scientist. I don't have a degree in science, but I understand the conservation of matter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well so, so not not quite that first part I was almost going to have this. Yes, if I was that professional and organized, wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, can I apply those settings to me, as we said before? Um, so, yeah, to some extent, yes. Just on paper, like a lot of my comedian friends, I don't have this perfect database that I have always dreamed of, mm. where the next time I perform for the American Chemical Society, I would go to the database and pull up every joke I have that's tagged with chemistry. And some of those might also be tagged with family, like that conservation of mass joke, or, uh, you know, something might be tagged with multiple things. So uh, that could be biology or chemistry or family or, you know, like multiple mm-hmm. kinds of things. or physics. Um, so that would be really wonderful. But yeah, to some extent, I do have that in that when I perform for the American Chemical Society, I will pull out, I will make sure to, to be ready to use most of my chemistry humor. But I have a lot of other stuff that this group of scientists should like as well. And and I try to cater specifically to any, like we do anytime, like any kind of audience. I do want to play to, you know, if it's physicists and I can, I can use my most obscure references, I will. But if it's a general audience, yeah, I have plenty of stuff. I started in nightclubs. Mm. Before I was the science comedian. I was just a comedian working nightclubs, but I was doing kind of geeky joke, like that conservation of mass joke and others. Right. So there were a lot of jokes I did that, I was doing in a nightclub to to people in various stages of drunkenness at, at late shows, and I was doing that. And certainly, though, there were some jokes that I shied away from, that they were like, okay, that joke, I love it, but it doesn't work well in this audience. And that's where I started to realize when I did shows for the right audiences, I did private gigs for Apple and Microsoft to a bunch of engineers. And I pulled out all of the obscure ones. And I remember specifically a great comment. The first gig I did for Apple, I did a couple years ago in the Bay Area. And the first one was like a worldwide developers conference at a hotel. And then they had this break where I performed for about half an hour to all engineers, really. Mm -hmm. And I have this old joke that is about how women have passed through my life like exotic particles through a cloud chamber leaving vapor trails for me to study for clues to their nature. <laughs> and, and I even say, you know, I know it's almost, uh, is that even a joke or is that a poem? What the hell is that? Um, right, right. <laughs> does he know that that's not a joke? Um, so <laughs> I, 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 I'll always remember this because it was early on. I was not science comedian yet. I was just Brian Mallow. And a guy comes up to me afterwards and he goes, I've never heard a joke about cloud chambers. And that line (laughs) stuck with me. It was like, right. It's like, who has jokes about cloud chambers? Exactly. Um, And I knew that I had to get that audience, the audience that would react like that. That's what I want. I want someone to, it's like, we have some shared interests and you don't normally hear them from comedians. Which over this past decade, it has changed a lot. I think that now more and more we do hear a little bit of science humor from comedians and uh, and in entertainment, on television, Big Bang Theory. There, but but going back a couple decades and then going back just the one decade to about when I started calling myself that, it seemed it was like a it was a pretty seemed like a pretty fresh idea because I think early on when if we ever heard science humor, it was just from scientists. They weren't comedians; yep. they were. Uh, scientists just being funny. And uh, 
which by the way, like I have some digressions here, but I do get asked if scientists have a sense of humor and people don't think they do. And I think they absolutely do. They're smart, creative people and they happen to be human and they do have a sense of humor. And I think, uh, but undeniably, we have seen some bad science humor (laughs) (laughs) by teachers and by, you know, it, it exists. And so that's why sometimes I think when people would hear, oh, science comedian, they either love the idea or they hate it. Yeah. They're not that wishy-washy. They, they're like, oh, that's going to suck. That's going to be horrible. <laughs> but, you know, I know from people that have become friends that their first, they went into a show of mine with trepidation. <laughs> but oh, right. they came out having gone, oh, that was funny. Because I was just being a comedian um, and entertainer. But once I called myself, a science comedian, I started getting this response where people would go, oh, so you teach kids about science mm. using comedy. And I was like, uh, no, I make, <laughs> I make people laugh is what I do. I'm sorry. Um, if you already like science, I've got great comedy for you. Right. Um, but there is some bit of content in some of my jokes. Like some of them are just silly, but others do take a science Event. Some I'm talking about my family and all of a sudden I apply this science concept to it. Others, uh, especially as I evolved, others were like science topics that I'm saying something humorous about. And maybe I am teaching you something and maybe I'm giving you a little bit of information so that you'll appreciate the joke I want to tell. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm building up to a joke. So there's some content in the setup. And that, in fact, that's, that was another thing that stuck with me from a comedy colleague before I called myself science comedian. It was that uh, I told him a new joke and instead of laughing or clapping, which is a response, you really never get one-on-one. You only get that from audiences. (laughs) You never tell a friend a joke and instead of laughing, they just break into applause. That has never (laughs) happened. They will laugh one-on-one, but they don't clap, but audiences will. Um, So I told him this joke and instead of laughing, he re- he just said, you know, your jokes have more information in them than most comedians' jokes. And I chose to take that as a compliment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Whether it was intended as one or not. So do you get more respect now that you're branding yourself? Now, you've been branding yourself as a science comedian for about 10 years. Do you feel like you're getting more respect amongst your peers or amongst people who talk to you when you throw in that comedic, you know, science part of being a comedian? Well, I don't know. I think that in some ways, once I did that, my career took a really different path. I used to do comedy clubs mostly. Mm. And then you would do, you know, colleges and private corporate gigs. And then it's morphed to where I, for a long time, didn't do many comedy clubs at all. And I did mostly private events and colleges. And then I started doing this other science communication stuff. I got the opportunity to make science videos at Time Magazine. And then uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson contacted me and I ended up doing uh, some pieces for his radio show, Star Talk Radio. Mm-hmm. And then I started going to these science conferences. So I kind of, my path diverged from from my a lot of my colleagues. I'll say that in the world where I, I'm performing mostly, I probably do get more respect than where I was, you know, 10 years ago in the comedy club world. And I think that, you know, if I go to a comedy club, you're in the same group as all the all the greats, all the way up to, you know, Louis C.K. and Seinfeld and everyone. But when you go to a science museum and do comedy and the rest of that speaker series has been uh, professors and authors of science books, then it's a sort of different thing than I kind of stand there. It's like I'm this special thing there where it's like we have a speaker series and for the in December, we're going to bring in a kind of lighthearted science comedian instead of this, you know, Nobel Prize winner. Um, so it is, it's like, it's such a different world and I am doing something a little different for that context. So different that sometimes, you know, they're not sure if it's appropriate, but, uh, Mm. I imagine one of the benefits of working these science gigs, these, these corporate gigs is that the bathrooms are better than the nightclubs. You know, the, the bathrooms are now undeniably alcohol. Uh, if we Mm. even look at it from a, a a science perspective, is an incredibly good catalyst (laughs) for getting the reaction that you want from an audience. But alcohol is also the worst thing that could happen to an audience, uh, especially on a Saturday night midnight show. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, it can be very hard to do clean, clever material to that audience. They're, sure. They arrive drunk and proceed to drink, and they're rowdy. So undeniable, like, so the audiences are really, there's a lot of great things about it. Um, I've performed in some really unusual places. And I'll tell you what, I don't know when this is going to come up, but um, you can be amongst the first uh, people I'm telling this to at the end of June. I've got an amazing gig that I'm so excited about where I'm, uh, I'm going to Germany, a town that I, uh, Lindau, Germany, that for 65 okay. years has had this meeting called the Lindau Nobel Laureates Meeting. And every year they, uh, and it's, it's by subject. So this year happens to be physics, but next year will be one of the other subjects that there are Nobel Prizes for, chemistry, biology. So this mm-hmm. year's physics. They have about 30 Nobel Prize winning physicists coming and about 400 young physicists from 80 countries coming for this week long meeting. So uh, a large group of Nobel Prize winners and a larger group of young physicists put them together for a week to learn from each other. And there's going to be a big opening ceremony and I'm going to be part of it. I'm going to perform at the opening of this to a group, many of whom uh, do not speak English as their first language. (laughs) <laughs> so this is so funny because just yesterday i got this uh follow-up letter with with a lot of information and it's almost i i kind of want to ask him if i can publish this letter because it's telling me how challenging the crowd the audience is going to be because he said all those things he said it's <laughs> physicists and it's like in in like our experience uh, the physicists don't necessarily have the best sense of humor of them. They're like the tightest or something, which I don't, I'm not sure if, I don't know if I agree with that in my experience though. And just saying that this is the challenge, then there will be another hundred or more people that are non-science people in the room. So how do you play to all these different physicists from different countries uh, without, uh, you know, how do you, it has to be universal enough. Pop culture references from one country aren't going to play in 80 countries, but I don't really have to rely on pop culture stuff. I have this science thing. And for this audience of physicists that it's science is a kind of universal language. So that's, but it was very funny for him to paint the worst possible picture and say, hope I haven't discouraged you yet. Because he (laughs) wants to let me know. And I'm like, I'm up for it. I'm going to take on this challenge. And I actually think it sounds like a great audience. I hope I'm right. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I would imagine when, when you're addressing a convention, how much time do you spend warming up the crowd? Because, you know, in a regular comedy situation in a nightclub, you have someone warming up the crowd. And so the crowd's already geared up and ready. Do you have to spend more time maybe talking to the crowd or getting them kind of into the vibe of what you're doing at a hmm. convention? Yeah, most of the time. There have been some times when there was something before me that maybe warmed them up. Another speaker who happened to be, who not only, you know, the opening act, uh, one of the roles, here's a little science of comedy. One of the roles of the opening act is just to get the audience focused on the stage. It's not even about making them laugh. I've uh, an old friend of uh, uh, one old friend of mine is Ron White. Um, he's one of the, oh, yeah, yeah, Ron White, Ron Tater Salad White. Uh, old, yeah. <laughs> old friend. I started comedy in Texas in, in Austin. He started in like the Dallas area, it might have been Atlanta. And then he was from Dallas, but whatever. Um, I've opened some big theater shows for him. And of course, so the, the deal is he doesn't want the opening act to have a very long set. The point of the opening act is here's this 2,000 people in a theater. They're excited. They're talking. And so when you first come on, that first 15 minutes, here's this period where they get focused on the stage. This is separate from the content at all. It's just get their attention, get everyone focused on the stage, and ideally get them laughing, but not tiring them out at all, only getting mm. them primed for the main act. That's like that's like the, the point of that. It's not, in this case, you know, the show isn't about me. It's about him. A lot of times you're on a show and maybe the show is about all of the comics and maybe yeah. somewhat equally or maybe a little skewed towards the headliner. But you know what? A special event at a theater uh, people don't even know who the opening act is going to be, maybe, and it, mm-hmm. it, it isn't. It, it is about the Ron White show, and so that and the opening act's function is is just this. It's uh, it's gets their attention, gets them warmed up a little, but it's all about the next hour and a half um, being perfect for that. So it's like a setup thing. So sure. I find that very fun, but I think it's interesting. And those audience sometimes they're great, and they 
they gel really quickly and and immediately I'm you know getting laughs on the first joke. Uh, so I've had some. I followed a speaker before, and you know, so they were focused on that speaker, and now they're just going to listen to me, and I'm going to be funnier. But most of the time, you're right. I've I've been just the single thing. It's an after dinner speaker. So now you are transitioning from dinner. They still have their coffee and desserts. Sometimes they try to get you to go on during a dinner at some yeah. sort of thing like this, and you're like, you know what? People's focus is on. You know, they're only going to be half focused on yeah. you. They're eating. They're eating, and they can't laugh or clap because their mouths and hands are full. So mm -hmm. we got to wait till after that. That's good advice for anyone yeah. who's yeah. going to be doing a gig like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's something that, like, when it comes to like negotiate, you go, you discuss that because you want them to know. It's like, no, no, no. We want. Uh, they can have their coffee, but the coffee has to have been served. They have mm. to have been done, done, done eating. And I've done things over a lunch before, and it's just rough. You can't have their attention as well. It's also in the middle of the day, and they're all very engaged in whatever they're doing. But at the end of the night, and they've had, again, the catalyst, a little bit of wine or uh, a drink or something. But that's kind of like, of course, why people will always prefer comedy club or theater or maybe rock club where it really is all about a stage and entertainment and focus on mm -hmm. the, the, the performance. But you know what? Maybe I've been lucky, but it always seems like the worse things were in the past, the, that the better you get and the stronger you get, it almost doesn't matter. Like people always like to ask about hecklers, but that is something that for the most part, the better you get as a comedian, the less it happens. Because you know what happens? If you're struggling on stage, yeah. The audience smells fear, sure. smells blood in the water, and and it opens the door. If you're if you're sort of uh, floundering, uh, it's no surprise that people are going to blurt stuff out. Yeah. But if you're so strong and confident, if you're like you know you're watching Louis C.K., there's no moment to blurt anything out. There's yeah. no, you have to be really obnoxious, <laughs> and also very self absorbed, maybe a little drunk. And, and But that does still happen. And unfortunately, it's the same thing that happens with j mega rock shows is that, you know, when they play, when that band played that small club, everyone that went to see them was a fan and hanging on every word and note. But then they're playing this huge venue and it's Pink Floyd and a lot of people are there just to hear another brick in the wall or something or, mm -hmm. or comfortably numb. And then the rest, they're just loud, obnoxious. They're talking. They don't know the song. They don't care. So like the bigger it gets sometimes, and that's been happening, I gather, to some comedians in really large venues, they get, there's a lack of politeness. And I've heard frustrating things you may have read about from people like uh, Chappelle, mm -hmm. where he gets very frustrated at these big shows because they're yelling out punchlines and yelling out requests and, and it's out of control. Yeah. Do you have any science hecklers? <laughs> oh, well, I'm susceptible to a, to an unfair discriminatory practice that I don't think most of my science, uh, my, my, my comedy colleagues have ever had to put up with. And that is, there is definitely an expectation that you know something about science and that the science jokes will be at, that, that they'll, be accurate. So I can get the kind of the heckler that wants to point out that there's something you just said something wrong. And it's the kind of I'd have to come up with some more examples. But I have one example. There was a joke when the many years ago when the stealth bomber was mm -hmm. a new thing. A lot of comedians, I heard this same joke from many comedians. And that's another issue. You know, a lot of times it's not theft. It's that this joke is obvious enough and easy enough yep. that all sorts of comedians wrote it. Because if you think of the premise, the punchline, a lot of people are going to come up with that punchline. And it's, sometimes it's, people it's say, the and evolution. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. And, you know, that's why a lot of people will advise if you're a comedian to young comedians or science writing advice is that is that you really work at it, that you write a joke. And when you write a joke, don't just stick with the first punchline you come up with. Okay, you just think you wrote a joke, but think about it some more. Maybe there's a better, maybe the first punchline you came up with isn't the most interesting punchline you could come up with. You came up with an immediate, sometimes it is, absolutely. But, but, but you don't know. It's like maybe the first thing off the top of your head wasn't the best thing. And you think about it some more and write about it some more and you might find a more interesting um, and less common punchline. So the joke that I, so the stealth bomber gets uh, introduced to our culture <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and becomes fodder for comedy. And this joke was written by many people where they go, uh, the stealth bomber is invisible. 
So why don't we just say we built a lot of them? Yeah. <laughs> so now, you know, to me, that was not even a joke because they say yeah. that you go, it's not invisible. It's just invisible to radar. Right. It's not invisible. Yeah. That's stupid. Yeah. There's no joke there to me because the premise <laughs> is nonsense. That's not, right. that's not true. No, nobody said it was invisible. No one said that. <laughs> it's not invisible. That's not a right. joke. Okay. Well, that joke, sure. many comedians did it and they did it many times because it killed and they got big laughs. So despite my problem yeah. with it would work so well. Well, that's the sort of thing. Now, I'm not saying I can't tell that joke to smart science audiences because, uh, you know, it, it could still work. But um, if if my setup, if the science is bad or wrong, I'm going to have I'm going to get attacked for it. And that's something that other comedians, uh, I don't think, really have to put up with. Do you have a vetting process? Do you have like a bunch of people, you know, who are scientists and you say, well, what do you think about this joke? Do you think that this is a joke that that is uh, uh, coherent, that is, val you know, valid, <laughs> scientifically well, speaking? Yes and no. I mean, formally, no. But the fact is, I know a lot of scientists. Now, I have a lot of scientist friends. And so if I write something that I have a question about, like it comes out of my head, but then I'm like, well, is that accurate? Does that? Because that was just a mm -hmm. joke. But but how does it relate to the science? I might go try to learn something. I might just go online and try to figure something out. Or yeah, I might run it by someone to see, yeah, yeah, to see if I tell them that joke, if there is a problem with it, like that, that or possibly it just connects to something they understand. Like maybe they'll have an idea because of, you know, their bigger understanding of the science. So it's like, if I told you this, like, yeah, what is that? You know, how does it, and does it, does it make them laugh would be mm. part of it. And part of it is if they just have any response to it. The other thing that my weird combination of, uh, you know, interests, the science and the humor led to was I took a job at a science museum in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And I came here from San Francisco four years ago to work in science communications, mostly to host events and to interview scientists on stage and to help them be better presenters on stage. One of the things I did at the museum was I hosted a science cafe on Thursday nights. And I'm, I'm gonna continue to do some of those. And we had a guy that was, you know, that recent uh, human ancestor discovery, it's called Homo naledi. It was, uh, it's, it was a previously unknown human ancestor uh, a, co a large collection of bones were found in a cave, I think, near Johannesburg. Okay. And yeah, 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 yeah. This was just uh, not too long ago. I think a few years ago and was published within the past year, maybe. So one of the scientists, that's one of the main scientists on the team, uh, we, I hosted a science cafe with him. And I, it turns out his specialty is human evolution and the evolution of tools and weapons and so I had this absurd old joke about um, uh, about being a, a, a late adopter of some technologies, like cell phones. I was a relatively late adopter of cell phones, but now, of course, mm -hmm. addicted as much as anyone. And I was also kind of a late adopter of the suitcase with wheels. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, and this is quite a long time ago, but, uh, and it, it like, like cell phones, I think like obnoxious people with cell phones, that's how I felt about it. It was always seeing obnoxious people with, and it was like flight attendants with their, like, I'm a man, I'm running late. My carry on bag is too heavy. And I'm, I have another bag. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to my gate. And then this flight attendant that has it all together, perfectly coiffed hairdo, crisp uniform, secondary bag, piggyback on top of the primary bag. Mm -hmm. all on wheels and smoothly gliding through the airport as I struggle. And uh, so a negative reaction because of that, a negative reaction to the wheel. But then like this funny realization, it's like, what am I waiting for? It's the wheel. Why not? <laughs> it's one of the first, I would say it's one of the first inventions. We, we came up with it shortly after the stick and monkeys use that. So what, I, so that's all very funny to say. But was the wheel one of the first inventions? Do monkeys use sticks or only chimps? So, you know, most people don't have to give any thought to that. And I, I kind of have to sometimes. And just like science advisors to move to science fiction films, you know, they, they give all this advice about what the science really is and what could work and couldn't work. But the filmmakers don't always use their advice. Sometimes they do. 
And it's a great idea for a new plot point even. But other times they choose story considerations over sure. scientific accuracy because it's a movie. Yeah. So in the same way, I almost always, though, I don't know. For me, it's like I don't it, I, I want to stick to scientific. Like there's no reason for it not to be accurate. I don't mm. want to put out anything. But in the, in the absurdity of saying like a, a, just a line like that and monkeys use that, um, you face this other thing that in the same way that story considerations for a comedian, the sound of words really matters. Yeah. And arguably, you know, monkey, I don't know. It's like the sentence to me, maybe I'm just used to it. But let me ask you, because these are two new sentences to you. Does one sound mm -hmm. funnier than the other? Um, the wheel, we came up with it shortly after the stick and chimps use that. Or we came up with it shortly after the stick and monkeys use that. I just think monkeys actually sounds funnier. <clears throat> monkeys is monkeys yeah. is funnier, but bonobos might work. Bonobos, well, they use a different Bono stick. Yeah, <laughs> but, a, but bonobos, is, <laughs> a lot. Uh, bonobos is inherently a funnier word than chimp. I, I would never say that because if you say bonobos, it has such strong other associations yeah. that yeah. it's not communicating. So I think that that would, it would, unfortunately, that would distract from what the joke is supposed to be. I, I think of sexy monkey, you know? Yeah. So when you're talking about sticks and sexy monkey, I don't know. It gets weird for me, I guess. That's a little rabbit hole. <laughs> I think he says more about you, though. Than yeah, anything. yeah. That's, it that's... does say a lot about me. Somewhat disturbing things, too. <laughs> like, so, yeah, what was the question? Did we answer that at all? Was I think we a... answered the question. I think we started off with science hecklers and just went with that man. And that... Right. One time I did a show. Yeah. Now, here's what happened this one time. I have a joke about performing in Tucson, Arizona in the middle of the summer when it was 110 degrees and how hot that was. And then a couple hours away at a place called Lake Havasu, it was 125 degrees. And that mm -hmm. just sounds like science fiction to me. I go, 125 degrees? You're talking about the surface of Venus. <laughs> and uh, to the back of the room, so I did that while I go, and for the back of the room, someone yelled out, no, <laughs> Venus is much hotter than that. And what I'd say is uh, that I actually knew that. I did know that, but I was using a comedic device called exaggeration. And I should be able to. <laughs> but that's so, so that's kind of the issue. So that, that plays to that issue of my scientific accuracy. But here's what happens. This journalist writes an article about me, and he quotes me as saying, you're talking about the surface of Jupiter. Oh, oh now, that's a big difference. Yeah. There are two major problems with that. One is... That Jupiter, you know, Venus is close to the sun and has this mm -hmm. runaway greenhouse effect. Yeah. It is hot and hotter than it should be. And Jupiter is far from the sun and not hot. It's not yeah. so, okay, so already it's wrong, but even maybe just as bad or worse, Jupiter is a big ball of mostly hydrogen and helium. It may not have a, a surface conventionally. So, mm -hmm. so all I could think is, you know, Someone I once I, I I once told the story to an audience where all these uh, esteemed people, one of whom uh, like Carl Zimmer, who's a very esteemed science writer, and I just all I could think is like, look, what if Carl Zimmer reads in the newspaper that this science comedian said that? And you go, well, he doesn't know anything about science, and so I just cringed because you know my mom would just think how wonderful that my you know that oh what a great right. article, and I'm like, sure. oh my god, I don't want anyone to read that and think I said that. Because yeah. it, it, it just undermines shows, your brand. That's what it does. Totally. And why couldn't you have just asked me? So that kind of stuff. <laughs> with other people don't really have to worry. Like Jerry Seinfeld could tell a joke. And the fact that there's a science error in it, no one is going to point that out because he's not claiming to be the science comedian. Right. Right. Yeah. And they'll let it go because it's like, you know, why would it's like, hey, that was a funny joke anyway. Sure. You know, sure. that's you know, if I said surface of Jupiter, most audiences would laugh. Ha ha ha. It sounds mm -hmm. like a joke. But anyone who knows something would go, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Man, I, I'm going to have to verify this. But I heard once there was a, an experiment where they played Johnny Carson to audiences that didn't speak English. And they tended to laugh at the right places anyway. Did they, did they and, take the laugh track out when they did that? Like, was it just... That's Johnny, a good question. I don't know. But, but presumably, like the way I... If this even happened, what I remember it as as showing is that that the verbal content is only part of it, and the nonverbal yeah. content, the rhythm, is a big part of it. Is that that when you're telling a joke, and just think of most comedians that become very well known have very distinctive patterns. George Carlin, true, um, true. Louis C.K., Dave Attell, right? Yeah. Mitch Hedberg, yeah. like they have very distinctive rhythms and patterns that are unique. And it's kind of part of why they became famous because they found they had a unique 
contagious, infectious voice. And very often, and I've had this experience, I've been caught up in a joke and they hit the punchline and you laugh. And after it, it pulls this laugh out of you and then you realize that punchline wasn't actually that funny. Like the actual content, you go, mm -hmm. oh, that one wasn't that funny. But it managed to pull the laugh out of you first before that recognition that it's like, oh, that was a slightly disappointing. That's maybe one of those, like you could have worked on a better punchline. Great joke. Sure. I was expecting a better punchline. And yet it worked. I've often thought it's such a weird experience. You go from city to city, you, you develop these words, these sentences, you hone them and develop them and hone them. And they, you tell them to different audiences all around the country or world, and they have the same response to it. If I go, blah, 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 they go, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and then I go from city to city, blah, 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 ha, ha, ha. And it works. And that's what you've identified. It's like, I don't know why, but if I say, hey, my last girlfriend was a lot shorter than me. In fact, the first time I saw her, I thought she was farther away than she actually was. <laughs> it always gets, even out of context, it always gets a laugh. It works. And what a weird thing. And we, we collect these and organize them and structure this show and we take it around to these disparate audiences and it almost always works the same. And what a weird thing is happening there. Yeah, I can totally see that because there's, you know, people don't all come to stand up on the same path. Like we've had people from theater backgrounds and so they're all about the presence on stage and right. about about being able to be magnetic, being charismatic on stage. And then they work on their material, you know, um, in a secondary manner. And then you have people who are writers and then they go up on stage. Yes. Wordsmiths, and they have to work on their stage presence. So, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so all of those things can work though, interestingly, you know, someone oh, yeah. can stand very still at a microphone and somebody else can can uh, prowl the stage like Chris Rock. Yeah, Chris Rock is magic. He's magic. Yeah, but somebody else like Todd Berry can just stand very – or Stephen Wright. Now, Stephen yeah. Wright would very slowly wander around the stage. But mm -hmm. maybe Todd Berry, I'm not sure, but maybe sometimes he's he's very quiet. He doesn't oversell verbally, you know, He's and he – and it's very carefully chosen words, and he doesn't move around much. So it's really – now, it's really dependent on the words, but also you got to say that that delivery of his, it's not that a total lack of delivery, it's that is the style of delivery. Yeah. And it has a certain attraction too. Yeah. True enough. So, Brian, you've done, you've helped scientists explain science to the everyday person. What, what's some of the advice that you give to them? Well, the funny, that's a perfect transition because what we're talking about right here. So, I've, I, I've, done many talks to scientists, and sometimes I call it a science comedian's guide to communicating science. I recognized early on in my career that I was too focused on the words, that I was really worried about, I didn't have previous stage experience. Mm -hmm. Stand-up was my first stage experience, really, to speak of since elementary school. If you're on stage, and you're focused on trying to remember the precise words because the precise words matter and I got to get it exactly right. And if you're trying to, to remember those words, you're turned inward trying to remember your script and you're not directed outward trying to really make a good connection with the audience. And this happens to, to people on stage all the time, whether it's comedy or science communication or anything else. If you're really worried about your script, then uh, you're probably not doing a good job in the nonverbal communication department, you're probably not making a good human connection out there. You're turned inward and your attention shouldn't be so much on what you have to say, but a little bit about your, you should be focused on the audience and what they need to hear. And so your focus should be on them. Like, you know, imagine this. I, I've often said a, uh, an audience, like sometimes you get think of an audience, like it's this amorphous blob. It's not, it's a bunch of individual humans. Mm -hmm. So the way you establish a rapport with an audience is pretty much like you establish a rapport with one human because it's just a bunch of humans. So imagine if you were one on one with someone and like having like getting to know someone and having a conversation, but you were pulling from a rehearsed script in your head. Mm. That would not that would be such an awkward conversation. It would never work one on one. So why would you think it would work to a hundred humans or a thousand? It's not going to because you're not connecting with them. Sometimes you see a scientist give a talk. And they're a little stiff. And you're like, eh, they're not that great. And then it ends and they go into their Q&A. Yeah. And the first question, someone asks them a question and you see this change come over them where they drop the script. It's like, okay, I no longer, I'm, I got through that, that thing that of having to, to give that talk. 
Now that's mm -hmm. over. And it's like, oh, I could totally answer that question. And they immediately become themselves and answer yeah. the question because they can. And it's that's the person they should have been from the beginning. Instead of this memorized script, you just get up, talk about what you know. Yeah. And you yeah. do know this stuff. Think about it, simplify it, and just be who you are. Be yourself. So being yourself is the key. To, and so all these other lessons, all the things that are important for being a good comedian, they're really just things for being good communicators. Uh, being relaxed, knowing your audience. The better you yeah. know the audience, the better you'll communicate to that. You don't say the same stuff to business people and legislators and children. You know, they, they don't, you know, to children, you might emphasize the things you need to study to become that kind of scientist. But to the adults, you're going to emphasize other things that are interesting and sometimes the, you know, economic implications of this research. But that's not interesting to children. So yeah. knowing your audience. So it's weird. There's a surprising amount of things that are. Here's another thing. In comedy, there's a setup and a punchline in a joke. And the setup has to have everything you need for the punchline to work. And, you know, some things like, you know, I might not have to explain who Johnny Carson is to a lot of people. But you know what? Today, to millions of people, you might have to, if you say Johnny Carson, you may have to say yes. he was like the, the famous host of The Tonight Show for decades. Yeah. Um, so it's knowing your audience so that you include the right stuff and don't include it if it's not necessary. And that's the key. So we always think you need to have this stuff to make the joke work. But just as importantly... You have to not have extra stuff. You only want the stuff that the joke needs. Anything else you add detracts from the punchline. It, it waters it down. And, well, that is true of all communication. Writing for stand-up comedy is a certain kind of writing skill, um, and it's practiced in front of a live audience. You write a bad book, you might not know for a long time. You tell a bad joke on stage, you know immediately, <laughs> maybe even before the joke is over, but you yeah. definitely know at the end of the joke whether there's a laugh or not. You're being judged every few seconds. You know, good comedians develop a very special communication skill of of not only being funny all the time, and mm -hmm. a lot of that also be also acting funny, presenting funny non-verbally by acting funny in some way. It might be Stephen Wright or it might be Jim Carrey. Anything could potentially work if you do it well. So there's almost no limits on that. But it's only one kind. It's not unique to comedy. You know, in comedy, the best jokes, the punchline comes at the very end. Like after you say the funny part, there shouldn't be other trailing words because you want, bam, you hit the punchline yep. and everyone laughs. And if you still have mumbling words after that, I used to have this punchline. I kept saying it the same way wrong until I, I thought I just was like, wait a minute, I'm going to get this line right. And I was always ending with, Already. And already is a almost completely useless word. Right. It are like sometimes write, writing advisors, or teachers say, don't use the word very. You never, the word very is a, devoid of, it's, it's a useless, they would tell you, go through your uh, manuscript and cut the word very everywhere it occurs. It's, it's, it's a useless mm -hmm. word. I, I can sh like demonstrate the idea a little better with a wood, an old Woody Allen joke, because I love jokes that aren't even funny. <laughs> until the final word. There are a lot of jokes like this that nothing is funny. Like the, the twist comes on the last word, or in this case, maybe it's the next to last word. The word, he had this, I think he would pull out a pocket watch. Uh, like, and he goes, this is a great watch. My grandfather on his deathbed sold me this watch. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the first part, so that's not the last word, but, but it's going along and it's just something that you hear all the time, right? It's like, oh yeah, my dad on his deathbed. And what that, the, the thing about comedy is it completely defies your expectations. You expect him to say he gave it to you and he said sold it. But the idea is, and sometimes it literally is the last word of the sentence. And that's- That's where the magic is. Fighting. And I think that, yeah. And, and this is not only for comedy because it's true of other prose. That the sentence, if you save the impact, not the punchline, but the most impactful part of the sentence for the end, it creates that kind of, uh, it cre it's, it's like a kind of energy you like. You know what? Sentence structure is a lot like molecular or atomic structure. Atoms and molecules have certain forms that are more stable than others. And they find that, and that, that, that those forms <laughs> click and, and they're the most stable 
And in the same way, sentences are like that. And, you know, sometimes, and I would experience this with my wife all the time, um, a spontaneous situation and you riff something. So you say something and it's very funny, but you immediately recognize there's a better way to say it. And you say the punchline again and again. And like, in, you quickly repeat three iterations. And by the third one, that's the version that you write down in your notebook so you don't forget it. But it's like, what it's doing, it's like, ah, what came out? You had a very funny idea, but it, it was almost there. And then it's like, how about this? How about this? Ah, here's the best way to say it. Yeah. You know. yeah. Well, you know, Brian, I, we've been talking for like over an hour. How are we doing, Jack? We got ridiculous. It is. <laughs> it goes so quick, doesn't it? It does. It does. I don't. Good. I don't think we talked about anything we said we might talk about. <laughs> Actually, you know, you'll be surprised, but I have a list of crap to talk about with you, and I think we've hit everything. To tell you the truth, we've talked about everything there is to talk about with this guy. <laughs> that's what. Oh, I'm no, not at all. This is the, <laughs> the, this is our secret skill of how we get you talking and manage to get you to talk about everything that we wanted you to talk about without yeah. you knowing. <laughs> but but since we are in our show. We can only, I think we hit, I think we hit all the bases, to tell you the truth. All the uh, chewy, gooey, good parts. I think it was fascinating stuff to listen to. Well, let's hope you're not the only two people who think so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, that's what, I, let's hope we're not the only three people who think so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just increased our audience by like 50%. Woohoo, rock okay. and roll. Yeah. So, Brian, so what would you like to close on? What would you like to plug? This is the uh, time that you get to plug whatever you want to plug. Well, like I said. I was always a lifetime freelancer, but for four years, I took this jaunt and I've, I've worked here in Raleigh at a science museum. I, it's been wonderful and I'm going to continue to host events at the museum, but um, I'm sciencecomedian.com. If you want to, there's a contact page there and you can drop me an email or get on my email list, but uh, I'm science comedian everywhere on YouTube and Twitter. So follow me on Twitter and on YouTube. If you go to my YouTube channel, science comedian, um, the most recent stuff I uploaded were five interview clips from a long Skype interview I did with Neil Tyson. More will be forthcoming, but there are five clips there. It's my intention to be putting out a lot more uh, audio and video content, uh, some more writing, and just to perform and give science communication talks a lot more often. So um, hire me for anything. That's the takeaway. Hire yep. Brian. <laughs> nice talking to you guys. Can't wait to see it. Hear it. See it on the web <laughs> yeah 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 thanks again man yeah it was fun thanks yeah it was I'll, I'll shoot you an email before it goes out just so you know so, cool awesome, make, awesome you know make me look good yep yep of course that's, that's, that's what, what we I do, do. <laughs> all right take care, all right take care yep. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> bye